twice. My first wife ran off with another man. We were both Christians. She did not see Christ in me. I did not treat her like the Bible says. We've all been to weddings. We've all heard sermons on how men are to treat their women. As godly men, we have this idea of what that is like. I encourage everybody, all men, to actually listen to a bunch of sermons on it, study the word, and make sure it's a very important part of what you're doing in your life. Because the idea that the world puts out of what a Christian man is and what the Bible says is completely different. And I'm not going to give a sermon on what a biblical man should be like towards his wife. But it is your responsibility and God will hold you accountable for your wife's spiritual welfare and the protection of your family. My first wife left. She, she shouldn't have left. All right? But she did not see God in me. The person that knew me the best, better than anybody else, didn't see Christ. So I get married again. Second wife, the day after we get married, I'm thinking I need to annul this. This was dumb. This wasn't biblical. It wasn't right. I wasn't following God at all. We got married in Vegas. You can only imagine what, what happened. And my wife says I could freely share this. And, you know, if you ever want to hear our testimony, I'll give it to you. But we were either going to end the marriage right there or we made an agreement. We we're either going to do what God says. We're going to be in the word. We're going to go to church every Sunday. And everything the pastor says we're going to do as long as it lines up with the word of God. That was our commitment. And from that point on, we started following the Lord. And great, great things happened. Okay? Great things happened. Within a year and a half, they're asking us to be a pastor and open up a church. Which I knew God wasn't calling us to do that at all. So, basically, when we both agreed we were going to be obedient to God and do what he says, it actually meant two different things to me and my wife. To right, so my wife, it meant we're going to have a Christian marriage. We're going to go to church. We're going to be Christian. To me, like the Homer Simpson guy, I was just like, okay, God, what? What? And I just started doing what he said. And I started going down the road of being an abolitionist. And it started scaring my wife. I started evaluating my wife spiritually. I started looking after her. I knew there was a problem. I knew something was going on. God is doing these great things in my life, like great things. You know, like people are coming to the Lord. I have fruit. You know, I would talk to my wife, and she'd be like, are you talking to me? Are you saying I'm in sin? And I'd be like, no, no, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about, you know, American Christianity. I'm talking about, you know, what God's showing me. After a few years of this, all right, of God doing great things, like great fruit, like literally, you guys know this from today, the fields are plentiful, plentiful. We just need harvesters. Well, that's how it is back home. You could take a walk and lead people, help people come to repentance. But my wife was like teaching Sunday school, going to church every week, reading the Bible for 15 minutes a day, and that was her Christianity. My Christianity was completely different than that. Completely. All right? So, in a second, I'm going to play some of the feelings my wife was going through while I'm the Homer Simpson just saying, Lord, tell me what to do, and doing those things. All right? Many of those things are the things that we, we're all doing now, you know? And many of you have been doing for a long time. Here's what I see among my brothers who have wives. This is what I see from you guys. Not all you guys, and not all the time. But you've actually taken abolitionism as your ministry, and you've put it above God. 
I see this. And the way I see this is the way you talk to your wives. We should not be condescending to our wives. We should represent Christ to our wives. We should look at our wives' welfare. They should not be abused by us because they're Christian and I'm a Christian and I'm doing the work of the Lord. We need to, men, we need to look at our wives. We need to evaluate them. We need to make sure that they're spiritually growing and okay. They shouldn't be sitting there in fear and worried and all these other things. Now, don't get me wrong. A wife of an abolitionist, a wife of a Christian, is going to go through tribulation. And God will use those tribulations to lift her up. Remember, it's God that lifts us up. If we place our ministry, or even the bride of Christ, even the church, I see people who do this. Like the church, they place it above Christ. And, and what God says to do is not the important thing. The important thing is the church. We can't do that with our ministries. So when we talk to our wives, it has to be uplifting and loving, and, and con we have to be concerned for them. And that doesn't just mean their spiritual welfare. That means their, their health. When we get home from work and we look at them and say you have a stay-at-home mom, you look at her, and you can see that she's just like, she's having a hard time. We need to look at them and evaluate them and make sure that they're healthy, that they're okay, that they've had time. Now, God will use the stresses of being a Christian to help lift them up. I mean, I remember a point in my life when I said, God, I can't handle one more thing. If one more thing happens to me, and for someone like me to say that, that it's kind of cryptic. My dad killed himself. Because he couldn't handle it. So when I say, I can't handle one more thing, what I was saying to God was, I, I, I need out. You know, I'm just going to do what my dad did. All right? You know what happened the next day? My first wife told me she wanted a divorce. That's what happened the next day. But if you love God, he, he will lift you up. You know, you may think you can't handle things or the pressure is too much. But it is God that lifts us up and takes care of us. So here's a guy that's not, he's not doing it wrong anymore, okay? He's evaluating his wife. He's, he's looking at her health. He's making sure she's taken care of. He's making sure that she is being loved. And one of the hard things for her is she feels all this, but she has guilt, you know, because she, I'm, I'm winning the game. I'm winning the love game. You know, I'm loving her more than she's loving me, all right? So, but here's, as an abolitionist, doing the work of abolition, here's the things, go ahead and play it, that she's feeling. And I'm not saying that when your wife's in trouble, you stop ministry. What I'm saying is, is evaluate it and do what God's telling you to do, all right? Which may be to stop ministry. Hi, I'm Stephanie Bullis. I'm the wife of Todd Bullis. I feel like God has brought me a long way and I want to share with everybody uh, where I am today and what he's been working on in our family. I full heartedly didn't understand God and I would end up tuning out. I would end up feeling like um, other things are becoming more important and so I felt God was just telling me just be supportive. Um, he's, you're still going to church, you're still doing the things that you feel, just be supportive, Todd. Okay, I can do that. You know, and all this time was, I'm just going to be supportive. I'm the wife that needs to be supportive. Just be supportive. And it was fine at that time, but it kept getting more and more and more, a little, in my mind, more aggressive, more out in your face. Over time, um, I think I just dealt with it. I felt that uh, Todd is my husband. Todd loves God. I trust that he wouldn't do anything to hurt my family. Um, he loves me. 
He loves my daughter. He loves his sons. He loves our family. So you can tell yourself that more and more and more and convince yourself it's going to be okay. And you know what? God was in control. The problem is, is that I didn't understand God. And I did not understand where God was taking us. Nor did I want to understand. Because it was bigger and scarier than I ever could imagine. And again, here I am going to church, going to my job, coming home. Todd's doing all this wonderful stuff out there following God. He wants to share everything that God's telling with him during the day when I come home from work. And I, for a while, listen, hear it. But God, God and Todd love me so much that they all saw through it. And I know they saw through it because Todd would stop talking to me about it. And what that did was it built walls between Todd and I. And um, walls that just kept building. So even though on the surface of everything, we were a happy couple, we were someone who was doing God's will, on the inside, I was hurting. I was troubled because I have this husband that I love dearly that is at this point in time in my life is not the man I married. He's not the guy that I thought I was going to live my Christian life with. Again, I'll keep saying this, I did not know God. It was better for me to take my daughter and me and tell Todd that this is not the life I want. I don't want my family in jeopardy. I don't want a husband that is out there getting verbally abused, etc. And we did get kicked out of a church. So there we have now, I don't even have a church to go to. Months and months of where do I belong in God's kingdom? Where do I belong in this marriage? Where do I belong in Todd's life? And God continued to work on me every day. I cried every day. I talked to him every day. Um, I thought, Lord, this is not where I want to be. You're doing God's will, but I don't like it. I don't like it. It's confrontational. It's something that I'm not comfortable with. Um, I didn't realize how bad it had got until the day that our church um, kicked us out of church, which in my mind wasn't against the church. It was against, see Todd, look, look what you're doing to my family. This is, <laughs> this is turning into a little bit more than I had thought it would be. So a lot of anxiety, a lot of pressure was going on in me. A um, couple more years down the road, uh, more bitterness, um, anger, that this is not where I was hoping my life would end me at. <laughs> um, anger at, I felt that Todd's number one priority was abolitionism. Um, wasn't my feelings. Wasn't my family's feelings. Even though that was completely false, it was just because he, I didn't offer it up. It wasn't that, it wasn't his priority. Um, but I did feel a lot of bitterness and anger. And that bitterness and anger took over any kind of blessings that were happening because we were still being blessed. Even though my feeling of bitterness and angerness was going on, we were still being blessed. So I went from anger, bitterness to very, very painful. And it wasn't painful from what you would expect. It was painful because I knew I had a lot of work. And every day was tears. Every day was working on Stephanie. God used abolitionism to heal things that were in my wife's early childhood where she couldn't deal with confrontation. She couldn't deal with anything that was difficult, even like an argument. 
I'm not saying stop if you have issues in your marriage. All I'm saying is, is make sure you hear the spirit of God. Do what you need to do to take care of your wife. It is more important to take care of your wife, the daughter that God has given you to take care of, than it is your ministry. First, it's God, your relationship with God. You have to be right with God. You have to hear God. You have to communicate with him both ways. You have to know his word. That's the most important thing. Then it's your wife. Take care of this daughter that God has given you to take care of. Lift her up. Show her who Christ is. Then your kids. If you're not doing that, what you're doing is you're taking abolitionism and you're sacrificing your family, which God does not want the sacrifice of your family, and you're placing abolitionism or your religion or whatever you want to call it above them, and that's, that's sin. So when I see somebody degrade their wife in front of me because they're doing the work of abolitionism, that's wrong. Your wife, right there, that moment is more important. All right, it, it's, just, it's just the way it is. So my wife got to a point where she wanted to leave me, and she said, I'm, I'm done. I can't handle this. And I said, well, all right, let's go to counseling. All right? The counselor, this is what she said after 45 minutes and like 200 bucks. Um, <laughs> she said, I got this. Like, this, I, I've seen this before. There's two things we have to do. She has to keep coming because she's got some issues, not about you, but she has some issues in her past that I see that you are lifting up, and, and I can take care of that. But it's only going to work if you do one thing. Stop all ministry work, all of it. And for me, it was easy. I was like, okay, I can do that because I knew my responsibility. I had been watching it. I had been working on it. I've been dealing with it. So I stopped. And you know what um, leaders in the pro-life movement said? And they're very strong, out there people that I'm sure would not mind me saying this. So I'll just say it. Like Greg Cunningham, Center for Biological Reform. He co I told him, and he goes, Todd, a man does not start to build a house without counting the cost. Let her go. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Here's my priorities. Here's what the Bible says. And he sent an email out to everybody in the pro-life movement saying I was quitting. All right? Which was fine. I don't have to tell anybody else, you know. But other people, <laughs> other people that I was really close to, like Jill Stanick, other people that are just like really, like, really take their ministry and place it really high, you know, and we were friends, and I still think we are on some weird level, um, but she was like, I think Greg's right. The pro-life movement needs you, Todd. We need to confront the church. What you're doing, this is what needs to happen. So I think Greg's right. You know, now later on, she said, yeah, I was wrong. What you did was right, and it has helped my family. See, when you keep your priorities right, God blesses it, and it also is an example to others. Like, you would not believe how many people want a marriage like my wife and I have. It, like, I actually plan out my week or my month to make sure that I outlove my wife. Like, it's a plan. Like, I don't just come home and, like, this is the way things are. And No, I actually want her to be loved and to feel that love. And you know what? My wife plays the same game with me. And I don't actually win that often that, for that week. She'll beat me. And it bothers me because what happens is as she's loving me, the whole time I'm like, oh, I need to do better. And then I do better, and then she's like, no, 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 no. 
I'm going to win this week. And it's the greatest game ever. But it came out of putting our priorities right. Like if my priority was the growth of abolitionism, I would have lost my wife. There's so many pastors or evangelists that their ministry is so important that their wives, they don't love them. They don't, they leave them. And we actually want to represent Christ in our marriages. If somebody sees us demean our wife publicly, nobody says, that's God. Nobody says, that's the kind of marriage I want. But if somebody comes over to my house and I'm rubbing my wife's feet, they're like, the women are like, man, that, look at that guy. <laughs> like, I want a marriage like that. And you know, my wife actually studies me to see what I like, what pleases me, what brings me joy. It's a great game, but it only comes because our priority with God is right. It's first. You know, it's like when we tell our kids, do you know that mommy loves me more than you? Yeah. And they're like, no. no yeah. And I'm like, go ask them. Go ask her. And they go ask her, and she's like, yeah, I love Papa more than you for sure. And they're like... <laughs> Like, I thought I was the center of your universe. But what we want for our kids is to have a spouse that that's the most important thing, not the kids. So the kids will grow up and they'll see a reflection of Christ in the marriage. So one of the issues with abolitionists is, is they're all in. Like, very few people come here and do this type of work on a regular basis that aren't all in but if you're not all in with your relationship with God and your relationship with your wife and in, with your kids like, please don't have your kids grow up to hate you you know we have a rule in our house and I hate this rule but if a kid comes up and asks us for help or to do something we do it because soon they're gonna quit doing that and they're not gonna want us to even like drop them off at school so when they ask for you, we, now I'm not saying you have to do that, but it's something we do. And again, I, it bothers me because I always have like good, cool YouTube videos to watch or make, you know? But the kids are so important. And like, you know, one of my good friends, I see this all the time and I'm like, I always hammer him on him. If your wife loves you enough to call you to bed and you don't go, I think you're kind of, foolish <laughs> you know and if she has to come four times like my wife would never come four times she would be like okay honey I'm going to bed and it's kind of like a question you know and if I don't go I'm giving up something fundamentally great now she may fall asleep and then I'll sneak out of bed <laughs> you know but there's a value in going to bed with your wife, for your wife. And there should be for you too, but a lot of times that's, you know, the kids are in bed, we can get some work done. Just don't make your ministry your idol. You know, like my dad, who I love very much, who's a Christian, my stepdad, I just call him dad, he loves hot rods. It's his passion. All right? Other people have, like, football as their passion. Like, God has given us the ability to have a passion. Don't make abolitionism or your religion a, just a passion. We, we need to be obedient to God and do what he says. If you want to be effective, listen to what God is telling you when you talk to these people. Keep your priorities right. Let God lift us up. And I can testify. He lifts you up. A 
a lot, my wife talks to a lot of the women. I don't think the evaluation the men have is correct on how the wives feel. I think the wives are a lot more fearful. Um, they're a lot more concerned. They feel a lot more alienated than the men think. And one of the biggest mistakes I see in, in today's Christendom is that a man will think because he has a godly wife that that's okay. That they can do the things God's calling them to do and the wife will just put up with everything. Well, you're supposed to do the things God's calling you to do. But don't sacrifice your wife. Don't sacrifice your kids. You know, I, it was Martin Luther who said something like, you know, I have to pray like five hours a day because I have so much to do. Well, if you have a wife and kids, make sure they're cared for and taken care of, and God will bless your ministry completely. Or if you're going to do it on your own power and sacrifice your kids, I think that's sin. So how, how much time do I have left? I got like eight minutes. <laughs> so does everybody want to hear all the examples of the abolitionist sin <laughs> that I see? <laughs> I won't do that. I'm joking. <laughs> but there is a freedom for you guys knowing that there's a God. And as long as you do the things he's asking you to do, He'll help you do these other things. And, and it's just the truth. I, I still have a few more minutes. Anybody have any questions or? Yes. Well, the question is, what if the, the wife is the abolitionist and the husband's either a non, he didn't say this, but either a non-Christian or a Christian that just hasn't like, you know, you know, pulling along. Here's what I think. You just do what the Bible says, okay? Which kind of, I like, I would have wrote things differently, okay? <laughs> but, but do what the Bible says. So in other words, he, he has some authority, all right? And if, say he's not a Christian, but you want to do the work of abolitionism, there is no better opportunity for that man to be saved than through you. You're there. You die to self. You obe you're obedient. You obey. You, like if he sets up these precepts and like, okay, I don't want you to hold signs with graphics. I want you home by 9 o'clock at night. Um, you know, and these are things you agree on and you kind of submit to. And, and you know, you, you place yourself under his authority. You're trying to be a biblical, godly woman who's married to someone that doesn't want to do ministry work. All right? You're in this situation then you talk to them, you work these things out, you come to an agreement, it may not be with agreement you want or like, and you stick to that agreement and you do the, first it's God, then it's your spouse. So in other words, you spend your life trying to save them, trying to bring them along, trying to lift him up. You know, like he should look at you and go, wow, God is so good. My wife literally came to me because I spent a year doing no you know, like, she used to say things like to me like this. Hey, let's go to the jacuzzi community pool. Let's go to the jacuzzi. But don't save anybody. Don't evangelize. Let's just have some us time, you know. So have that time with your spouse where you're doing nothing but loving them and serving them and dying to self and lifting them up. My wife, literally, after I spent a year outside of Ab doing any type of ministry, she came to me and said, um, honey, I actually need you to start doing abolitionism again <laughs> because I'm not going to grow past where I'm at. All right? And my wife now is an abolitionist. 
she's actually talking to people at work. She's dropping cards. You know, she's like, I'm out of cards. Um, she'll actually go and hold graphic images. If you want to see like an hour, this is like an hour long. I just pulled out some of the feeling words. I don't understand them too much, but. <laughs> but if you watch it in context, you can see what's really going on. And she, now, I mean, I got pictures of her with graphic images. She's like talking to people. I, got, I mean, it's great. She actually knows God now. Like, she'll say things like, I didn't understand God at all. But I couldn't really s tell my husband to stop because I saw God using him. Like, she would tell people at work, oh, you should have my husband pray for you. God listens to him. <laughs> so how does a woman who's a Christian, supposedly, stop the flow of God? She didn't want to get in the way of that. But... It was killing her. It was killing her because she had to choose. She had to grow. She had to do things that, you know, from her past was very difficult for her to deal with, you know. So, well, sorry for the long answer. Uh, any other questions? Yes. The, the question is, as a child, how, do we submit to our parents when we want to do the work of abolition and they maybe want to qu quash it or, you know, protect or, you know, like how, how, how do you deal with that relationship? So you obey your parents. You talk to them. All right. You work out a deal. What's that? Yeah. You could talk. You, you could talk to them, witness to them, tell them like, hey, this is why this is what's going on. You could say, hey, OK, if this is your concern. How about this? How about if there's always like two guys or how about if this or, you know, I mean, you just try to work something out. I mean, you, like literally, like when I met some of you guys, my wife's like, well, how old are they? And I'm like, oh, they're our, they're our age. And then my wife will go, she'll meet them and she'll go, they could be our kids. <laughs> you know, it's like you'll grow up quick. You know, honor your parents. God, God will bless that, you know. Okay. And I also edit, used to edit a lot of the abolitionist videos so I could hear them talk to their wives. Okay. And so, like, uh, this isn't coming from complete out of nowhere. Love your wife, man. It's a great gift. And if you have a horrible marriage, if just one of you dies to self, if one of you is righteous, one of you honors God, it makes a huge difference.